Well, let me introduce you to Daniel Kish. You can see him here riding a bicycle. Now, as you look at this image, you may not know this, but uh, Daniel Kish is completely blind. Yet he's able to ride a bicycle. He's able to walk anywhere he wants to go. He's done some amazing things without having sight. And one of the ways by which he does this is Daniel has employed a technique which is used by many animals, like dolphins, for example, or bats, called echolocation. He clicks or ticks and makes a noise, and he listens for the echoes of that little tick noise that he makes to bounce off of objects. And his brain has been trained to interpret what his ears hear to kind of find their position. And he can do some absolutely amazing things, given the fact that he can't see at all. And I want you to watch his TED Talk. That's one of the most amazing TED Talks I've ever seen, is how this guy gets around the world with echolocation. Now, why do I put him on my lecture here on radar? Well, it turns out radar basically does the exact same thing, except it doesn't use sound. It uses light, but it's light that we can't see. It's microwave light, really long wavelength, radio wavelength light. In fact, that's where the term radar comes from. It stands for radio detection and ranging. And the technology was born in the late 1800s, but really became in, in, in really big use during uh, World War I and World War II, specifically World War II. You see, during that war, uh, radars were being used to detect enemy aircraft because we could basically scan the skies and look for large objects like airplanes or even scan for ship masts and th see things like this. What's interesting about this? Weather was a nuisance to radars. You see, not only could we detect enemy aircraft, but we could also detect snow and rain and hail and all sorts of different types of precipitation. We could see all sorts of stuff like birds. We could see bats. We could see all trees and buildings and all sorts of stuff with our radar. So while it's humble beginnings kind of start off with, um, well, trying to detect enemy aircraft, it can now do a whole wealth of things. And uh, it's one of the most important inventions we have in atmospheric sciences. You know, we just uh, finished having lectures on satellites and their ability to detect stuff from outer space. Well, radars, most of them are ground-based observations. And unlike the satellite, which is a passive instrument, which means it's just measuring emitted radiation uh, from heat of objects or measuring reflected radiation from the sun, you know, like a visible light, um, our radars are active. In other words, they broadcast a signal and measure something that comes back. By the way, should, we should be thankful that our satellites, you know, those space-based uh, instruments, aren't active. If they were, well, our visible satellite image, uh, uh, satellites would be using a flash every minute to take a picture of Earth at night. And that would be, well, that flash would have the brilliance of the sun. So be thankful we don't do that with satellites. But let's come back to radar here. Radio detection and ranging. This is one of the most famous radar images that we've got. What you're looking at here is a radar image captured by a guy by the name of Don Staggs back on April 9, 1953. And what's amazing about this radar image was that Don, along with Glenn Stout, working at the Illinois State Water Survey, were breaking the rules. You see, they had an old ship radar, so this radar on a military ship, that was given to them to do research with. Now, there came along with that radar rules. And one of the rules was, if there was ever severe weather in the area, turn off the radar, unplug it, remove its power source, and angle the dish toward the ground so that the wind wouldn't tear it apart. Well, on that night, Don and Glenn broke all the rules. A massive thunderstorm was going north of town. Where's town? It's this. You see, all of these stationary targets you see here are called ground clutter. And what you're getting here are all the trees and buildings of Champaign, Illinois. But the radar was also scanning up in the sky and looking at this thunderstorm. And while Don Staggs was taking Polaroid pictures on the radar scope, he saw that feature right there. And he labeled it a fish hook. He sent his data that he collected all over the country to a lot of scientists, one of which was studying tornadoes at the University of Chicago, Dr. Ted Fujita, and uh, there showed him the images. And it was amazing because this basically began the modern era of using radar to detect tornadoes. So here's an image from 1953. This is a modern day radar image. The radar out of Dodge City, Kansas, which is right over here. Do you see all like these echoes here? This is all ground clutter. But this was a massive supercell thunderstorm that I will never forget. It was a Friday evening, May 4th, 2007. 
I'm sitting on the couch at home with my wife, and she was watching a television show. We were getting ready to go out to dinner, and I was looking at this radar image. And I told her, I said, Elena, I just saw one of the most spectacular supercells with one of the most pronounced hook echoes and hail cores I've ever seen. And it just went over the top of this town called Greensburg, Kansas. And I said, I would expect there was a mile wide tornado inside of this. And because it hit at night, the sun had already set. As this tornado went through, I told her, I said, I bet we just had our deadliest U.S. hurricane, or sorry, U.S. tornado on record. And I was amazed the next day when I started to see images like this. That's Greenberg's, Greensburg, Kansas, the day after that powerful EF5 tornado went over. It destroyed 95% of the structures in Greensburg, Kansas. What was amazing? This radar image. You see, 30 minutes before this image was taken, well, this same supercell was way down here, moving from the southwest to the northeast. And this radar image alerted National Weather Service radar meteorologists. And they warned Greensburg, set off the sirens about 30 minutes in advance. So when that tornado went through and ripped apart the town and destroyed it, miraculously, only 11 people lost their lives. This is a major credit to all the research that's been done since Don Staggs and Glenn Stout discovered hook echoes. On And the research that's come out of this on, on tornadoes has been spectacular. And while our radar systems are a part of our civil defense network, they're also there to protect us by warning us of major severe weather events. So we put up a network of them. What you're looking at here is the network of the NEXRAD WSR-88D radar system. WSR, Weather Surveillance Radar. 88 stands for 1988 when they started to build it. And the D stands for Doppler. Each one of the circles around the radars here represents uh, basically what it can see at an elevation of around up to about 10,000 feet. So we have really good coverage when you really think about getting, uh, you know, we kind of draw a line here, uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. In fact, there's very few places that don't have good coverage. There's a couple of holes. We got this one right here in Missouri, a couple of them in Missouri, some of them down here near Oklahoma and getting into Texas. We also have this one up in the Appalachian Mountains. So there's a few pockets where we don't have good radar coverage. But out west, it's a lot more spotty. There's a reason for that. Well, one, we don't have a lot of people living in the mountains. And two, the mountains will block the radar beams. But there are some spaces out in the west where this radar network misses on purpose like this area right here in parts of Nevada. Now I'm going to show you something kind of funny here. This is a radar image showing you a day where the four surrounding radars surrounding this area right here were all blocked. Do you see this spike right here? There's another one right over here and another one right there and the fourth one's down here. They're all kind of looking somewhere right in through here. And right in through here there's a large military base. And on this particular day, well, the government must have been doing something fun, like flying really fast airplanes. Now, not doing alien research. This is, of course, if you have any idea, this is where Area 51 is. If you have no idea what that is, just Google it later, and you'll have a whole afternoon of great reading about aliens, okay? Landing in, in parts of New Mexico and then doing research on them in, in Nevada. Okay, not happening. But there is a government military base right here. And every time they're testing something, they don't want our local weather radars to be able to detect, well, where the object is or how fast it is flying. Because that's one of the things that our radars can do. Pretty amazing. So they send out a huge isotropic blast of radiation and it blocks all of the radar beams so they can't see anything. Basically blinding uh, the radars. Speaking of blinding the radars, you don't ever want to get a speeding ticket again? Buy your own radar gun. And when the police officer is kind of detecting you with their radar, well, you can take your radar gun and kind of blast it back toward them, and the signal will interfere. And as a consequence, you won't be able to, he won't be able to detect or she won't be able to detect your speed. Now, you're going to get arrested for doing this, but uh, it's something interesting to kind of think about. You can blind radars. In fact, our radars are blinded every day when the sun sets. As the sun sets or when the sun rises and the radar dish stares at the sun, well, the sun is producing microwave radiation and it blinds the radar. So kind of a little bit of long-winded ex explanation there, but I want you to see this. This is the government doing something really fun right here, probably testing some high-speed new aircraft. All right, some other problems. I got a couple of images here. One, I got the KILX, that's the radar out of Lincoln, Illinois, and the KLSX, that's the radar out of St. Louis. Do you see how both of them have these huge spikes? 
Those are from cell phone towers. Your cell phone communicates via radio waves or microwaves. And the frequency of them is too close to the frequency of the radars that we use across the country. Therefore, the cell phone tower broadcasts a cell signal right at the radars and it blinds them. Also in the image that's on the right, these features right in through here, these are wind farms. We'll take a look at that in just a few minutes. Now, check this out. I captured this on my cell phone a couple of years ago. All of a sudden, out of the radar that's near Kansas City, we saw these weird stripes. It turns out the government was doing a test. You see, military aircraft, when they fly, have a defense mechanism where they can spray what's called chaff out of the back of them. It's little tiny bits of aluminum and other materials that can really confuse radar-guided missiles. So they spray this stuff out, the radar-guided missile gets confused, and it hits the chaff and blows up. So we're just testing some of these systems. These are long trails of chaff. So this is back in 2016. Neat to see that. And this is what I want you to see. The radar dish is tucked inside of a radome. So this feature right here is called a radome. And the radome is basically there to protect the radar. It's a large, I think it's made out of some kind of fiberglass, large fiberglass dome that protects this huge 30 foot wide dish or so. It's about 30 feet wide. Now it's there to protect it from getting rained on or snowed on or getting covered in ice. It also keeps critters like bats and raccoons and all sorts of stuff from nesting up in there. It also has some lightning protection on it, which is what you see up here. So the ray dome is designed to protect the radar. Now just remember this, messing with the Nexrad radar system is a federal offense. For some reason, people shoot the ray domes all over the country all the time. I don't know why, but occasionally they, they get shot. Um, it's probably the same people that shoot stop signs out in the country. Stop doing that. Don't shoot the radars. Uh, it's, uh, they're very expensive to repair. Now, on the inside of the radome is the dish, and the dish is collecting data like you see here. Now, check this out. That was an animation of Hurricane Marita as captured by the radar on, uh, in San Juan there in Puerto Rico. Now, as that hurricane approached, it produced incredibly fast winds, 145 miles an hour. You can actually see a double eyewall structure at times there. Well, I don't have any more radar imagery after that one right there. And that's because as soon as the hurricane got to this point, it did this to the radar. You normally have a big radome on top. It destroyed it, ripped it off, and the dish that sits on the inside. That's what hurricanes can do. What does that dish look like? Well, here's one. This guy's standing up inside uh, of the ray dome, and here is the dish. So here's what it looks like on the outside. This is inside. Here's a research radar that doesn't have a dish around it. Or sorry, doesn't have a, a ray dome around it. This is called S-pole. And what's neat is the most expensive part of the radar is actually this little thing you see right here. That's the waveguide. It sends the microwave pulse up to this little, this little horn here, which blasts it against the, ray, uh, the dish and then focuses it in a narrow beam going out. What real mobile radar looks like is what you see right here. This is the Dow 6, Dow standing for Doppler on wheels, which means we will drive these radars right up next to some of the most severe weather on the planet, massive supercells, even hurricanes, and observe it up close. That technology has revolutionized our ability to understand the dynamics of some severe storms. So these are what radars look like. Now, how do they work? Well, they send out a that they broadcast really a powerful microwave signal. And uh, that microwave signal is uh, basically around a, a megawatt. That's a million watts. In other words, the microwave signal that's sent by these radars is the equivalent of a thousand times the power that your microwave operates at. Now, the reason why radars don't cook raindrops is because they don't operate like your microwave oven. You put food in your microwave oven and push the button. In fact, my son loves this. He's five years old right now when I'm recording this. He thinks the microwave is, is this amazing instrument. Think about it. He puts food inside of it, closes the door, pushes some buttons, and then without fire, cooks his food. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens because the microwaves that the microwave oven uh, sends out, well, they make the fat molecules, the, um, the, the oil molecules, and the water molecules inside of food vibrate and jiggle very rapidly in place, therefore rapidly cooking the food because we know that the definition of temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules. So microwaves jiggle, well, they jiggle the liquid. They jiggle the fat inside your food. Now, 
The microwave works by continuously producing a radar signal, continually producing a microwave. But the radar does it differently. The radar produces its signal as a pulse, one big pulse that gets sent out and it bounces off of raindrops. It basically is reflected off of them and it's reflected in all directions and all that the dish is trying to do is measure some of that light, some of those microwaves, some of those radar waves as they come back to the dish. Now the radar is incredibly sensitive. Uh, it sends out a megawatt and it then watches for radiation, that would be ra uh, radio waves, to come back to the dish and those uh, radio waves that come back, they have a power of 10 to the minus 16. Now, what does that all mean? Well, if I were to stand on my back deck and shout at my lawn, that would mean I would have ears that were sensitive enough to hear the echoes of my voice off of every blade of grass. That's ultimately what the radar is doing. It's measuring echoes off of every raindrop. Now, the animation at the bottom from the Comet program, which is out of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, well, it's kind of a little misleading because you can see here that it looks as though the beam, as it goes through the, the raindrops, that it uh, basically attenuates the beam or extinguishes it. It bounces off the drops and doesn't go any further. In reality, it keeps passing through because some of the radiation scattered forward. But basically, a radar is a giant pulsed microwave oven. Now, the radar doesn't cook anything, and that's because the radar basically spends one microsecond sending out a signal. That's a millionth of a second. And then it listens for a, a, a millisecond, which is a thousandth of a second, for the echo to come back. That means in a full hour of operation, the radar only spends about seven seconds transmitting signal. But it sends out a lot of signals, and this is how we look at the data it collects. So the echo the reflected microwaves that come off the raindrops that comes back, we give it a name. It's called radar reflectivity. Now it's very simple to understand the radar reflectivity, and this is the beauty of the design of the radar. You see, we get Rayleigh scattering off of raindrops, and as a consequence of that, the bigger the raindrop, the bigger the scattering event, or the more radiation that comes back. Therefore, when we look at the echoes, they're proportional to the number of drops and their size. Make sure you remember that point because this is the entire design behind radar. You see, when you look at a radar image, what are you looking for? You're looking for the intensity of the precipitation. And you know that big drops and more drops mean more rainfall. So the bigger the drops there are, the higher the radar reflectivity and the more intense the precipitation. Now, what does the radar do? Well, it can measure the presence and the coverage of the rain. And that's because it basically sits underneath inside that radome and swivels on a pedestal and traces out kind of a circle, a big arcing circle of precipitation. It can tell you the location because it can measure the time the signal goes out and comes back. It can tell you the intensity because it ultimately measures the size and number of the drops. It can also integrate the intensity over time, giving you an amount. And this is the cool thing about Doppler technology, which we'll learn about in the second half of this video. It can measure the wind speed and direction. Now, how often do we leave it on? It's on all the time. Our 160 radars are left on all the time because at any moment, they can be used as part of our civil defense. What do I mean by that? Well, if uh, the United States is ever attacked by a foreign adversary, our radars can detect enemy aircraft. Also, it protects us from severe weather, so we have to leave it on all the time. And how do we view the data? Color-coded maps. And the color coding is related to intensity. Remember that. The color coding is related to intensity. Now the unit that we use is decibels of reflectivity, dBZ. Not Dragon Ball Z, but dBZ, decibels of reflectivity. And you've probably seen these images. When we get into these brighter colors and the warmer colors, we know that we're getting into, like the reds, we're getting into more intense precipitation. But I want you to remember something specific about this. Okay, here we are zoomed in on this massive supercell thunderstorm in Texas. Do you see how the radar reflectivity values, look at this, they're bright reds, then they get over to these like pink purple colors, even some white in there. What I want you to remember is, whenever the radar detects reflectivity values over 60 dBZ, we're seeing hail. And in this particular day, we actually saw hailstones that were four and a quarter inches in diameter in Midland and Odessa, Texas. Now another neat thing that we can do here, not only measure the intensity, but also measure the amount. You see this same reflectivity scale, dBZ, can be related to by this table into a rainfall rate. So if you look out and you see uh, you know, this color right in through here, which is about 40 dBZ, well 41 dBZ corresponds to a half inch rainfall rate per hour. 
Now, when you get up here to 55 dBZ, we're talking about really, really heavy rain, four inches an hour. And when you get way up here, well, you have hail contamination because the most it's ever rained in an hour that we've been able to detect on Earth was 12 inches in one hour. So what we're seeing up here when it gets to 65, this is hail contamination making us think it's raining more heavily than it is. But your main take home points here, we can measure the intensity, the amount, the location, presence, coverage. The radar reflectivity is related to the size and the number of the drops. And if the radar reflectivity values get above 60, we are detecting hail. And here's a couple of images of some massive hail. You got this NOAA vehicle, look at the hood, look at the windshield just destroyed by it. And this is one of my former students, Mackenzie, who took this picture of some massive hail here. That's near softball size hail in Washington, Illinois from just a few years ago in 2013. Holy cow, that's some big hail. All right. Let's test you, okay? In the background, I have an image from the Storm Prediction Center. It was outlining a day when we had these nasty storms that went over Minneapolis-St. Paul. The Minneapolis-St. Paul radar is right here. All right, do you see any hail in this animation? Watch it again with me, it'll start over. You're looking for colors way up here in the color spectrum. I see it right there along the leading edge. You see, this squall line as it passed through not only produced incredibly powerful winds, but also a lot of hail. Remember, I just taught you about satellites. Check this out. This is an infrared satellite animation of the top of that thunderstorm complex. The anvil cloud, that's that cloud that sits on top, the big flat one, size of Minnesota. That is absolutely enormous. Underneath, the storm was producing these kind of winds. I got this video courtesy of the person who took it. Incredible to see the strong winds inside of that powerful squall line of thunderstorms. But like I told you, there was some hail. In this next video I'm gonna show you, this guy is not blowing snow, he's blowing hail. This is a whole bunch of marble-sized hail. This is June 2017. Watch as the woman who took this video, who gave me this video, watch as she reaches down and picks up some of the hail. Incredible, incredible to see that. This particular storm ended up costing over a billion dollars in damages. Not only from the damages that it did here in parts of Minneapolis, St. Paul, but the crop damage it did outside of the city. See, this is what our radars can do. They can not only detect the intensity of the precipitation, but they can tell us if we're looking at hail. Impressive to see, to say the least. All right, let's give you a little bit of a quiz here. You're looking at a radar image, and I've got a bunch of labels on it. A is down here, so you can see that. B, C, D, and E. Which of these letters is sitting in the hail core of the supercell thunderstorm? Take a look and think about it. All right, I hope you came up with the letter C. You see, C is sitting over these colors right in here, 55 to 65, and that's where the storm is producing hail. Uh, another question for you. Which letter is in the ground clutter? Now what's ground clutter? That's where the radar is detecting, well, buildings, birds, maybe trees, tall objects near the radar. While the ground clutter, well, it's not in the storm. It's right down here. All of these echoes, they're from non-meteorological targets. We'll talk about them again in a few moments. Then I have this question for you. Letter E right here is sitting in a region of the storm with very heavy rain. The color shading there is that first shade of red. In other words, it's this one right in through here. If this storm were to remain stationary for two hours, how much rain would fall there? Let's think about this. Well, when I think about it, what I see is this color red corresponds to a reflectivity that's somewhere around, well, just a little bit above 50 dBZ. On my chart, just above 50 would be 52. That corresponds to a rainfall rate of 2.5 inches per hour. If it stayed stationary for two hours, take that and double it, the answer is five inches. So if this storm stayed stationary, which it didn't, but if it did, you get five inches of rain out of that intensive a rainfall event. Okay, hopefully those uh, kind of helped to clear up some of the stuff we just talked about. Check this animation out. 2008, every 10 minutes, we are now watching national radar. Now I'm gonna turn off the music. There we go. 
What you're seeing here is every 10 minutes, all of the radars, 160 of them across the United States, stitched together into one composite image. So in other words, we stitch the images together. There's not one big radar in somewhere in Nebraska. Look, you can see our weather systems going from the west to the east. Big, big, big winter storm right through there that comes through and dumps a bunch of snow in the northern parts of the United States. Big severe weather break we just saw there. But it's pretty clear that our weather moves from the west to east, and we're just detecting all those weather systems as a function of time. But this is now January 26th, 27th. Let me get you a little bit farther out here. Now we're here at the end of March and the beginning of April. Now watch this. You start to see these flashes going from the east, that's on the right-hand side, to the west on the left-hand side every day. See them there? What the heck is causing that? You can still see the big weather systems going through, the big heavier, there's a big cyclone right there. But these flashes, you wanna know what they are? Those are bugs and they come out each night as the sun sets. Look, this big weather system went through and cleared them all out. And now they come back with a vengeance. Look at these bugs, just so many of them. So I can pause it right here. Let's see, there we go, look at all the bugs. You see, each one of these radars is in a mode called clear air mode. And when we put our radars into clear air mode, which means there's no precipitation around, they can detect some pretty amazing things. And all the blotches you see here, this is sunset, when the bugs come out. Now let's talk about these modes. I've got a couple of radar images here. We got one where you have a hurricane making landfall on the right, and one here kind of showing you the radar in uh, uh, near Romeoville, Illinois, up here near Chicago. Now this radar is in clear air mode, which basically just means they slow the scan rate down. So now they're scanning really quickly, they slow it down, and they allow the radar to display the, uh, display the very low values. What you can see is almost all of this is birds and bugs and dust and all sorts of other things. And you see this little fine line through here? This is the lake breeze coming off the lake, kicking up some of those bugs and pushing them out of the way. And the radar is scanning them. Now, when there's a storm nearby, they often change the color scale, not showing you the really low reflectivity values like you see over here, but often cutting it off at around zero or five. Now you don't see all this clear echo. And also, the radar scans much, much, much faster so it can get more images of the heavier rainfall. So that's the difference between the two. Big take home points, well, clear air mode, you get echoes from bugs and birds and dust and turbulence and all sorts of other stuff. We even have to turn our radars over into clear air mode when there's light snow because snow's not a good reflector. But over here, we're in clear air mode where we're starting to see the precipitation echoes and they generally fall when the values get above 15 to 20 dBZ. One other thing just to make sure you remember, we call all of the clear air echo ground clutter. Okay, that's the common term. All right, here's a quick test to show you. This radar is operating in clear air mode. And all of the stuff that you see here is ground clutter, non-meteorological targets. Most of it, birds, bugs, and stuff like that. But you see these straight lines in here of really high reflectivity? See, they're there, here, and over here. What the heck is causing those echoes? Well, this is what's causing them. Rose and rows of wind turbines. See the wind turbines right here? See their shadows? You see when the radar scans the sky, the tip of the turbine blades is off, often intersects the radar. As a consequence, we can see the wind turbines. So wind turbines are showing up everywhere on our radar imagery. And the problem is, well, it looks like it's storming right there, but it's not. These are just wind turbines and they're hard to remove from the data. So some neat consequences here. All right. I went to the Indianapolis 500 in uh, June 2018, or at the end of May 2018, and it was fantastic. Now, I want you to watch this video because it turns out this video is incredibly important for me to teach you the last thing I need you to know about radar. I want you to pay special attention to the sound the cars make as they pass in front of me, okay? Listen up. Here we go on a restart. Pretty amazing. Each one of these cars, as they go flying in front of me, see there they go on down the track, are moving up between 200 and 220 miles an hour. But did you hear the sound, the yo, yo, why does it make that sound? My son is absolutely fascinated with this. Every time he plays with his cars, he always makes that sound. And I say, Graham, why do you make that sound all the time? He says, well, that's just the sound cars make. I said, do you know why? He said, no. I said, well, why don't we try this out? 
So I had my son stand at the end of the driveway and I decided to get my car out and I drive a twin turbo BMW 335XI with a slight cob tune on it making about 400 horsepower. Okay, so I'm a bit of a car nerd. Well, he's standing at the end of the driveway and I go down the road and I said, now you stay right there and I want you to listen to the cars I drive by. Now, I live in a neighborhood, so I didn't drive by at top speed. Instead, I drove past my son honking the horn. And when as I approached my son, the pitch of the horn, just like you heard with the cars, listen again. My horn did a very similar thing. It was high pitched as it approached him and low pitched after it passed him. Now, many of you have probably heard of this phenomenon. It's called the Doppler effect, okay? And the Doppler effect is an effect with sound. Now, what is it? And why did this work for my son? Now, he thought I had a pretty cool horn. He thought I could adjust the sound of the horn, but in reality, I just was driving past him. Now, this is what's going on. I've got two ears here. And this dot is emitting sound and we're seeing the sound waves. Those are the circles. Now, the dot is moving toward the ear on the right and away from the ear on the left. The sound waves are bunching up toward the ear on the right and spreading out toward the ear on the left. Therefore, the ear on the right hears a higher pitch sound, like my horn honking, or the cars in the video as they approached my video camera, whereas the left ear hears a lower pitch sound like the horn after I passed my son when I drove in front of him, or the cars after they got down the straightaway in the previous video. If the object's stationary, both ears hear the same thing. But if it's moving, we can detect a difference. Now, our radars have the ability to not detect shifts in sound, but shifts in light. Shifts in light in microwaves and radio waves. It basically boils down to this. If the wind is blowing a raindrop toward or away from the radar, we can detect a phase shift and a frequency shift in the echoes that it makes. And we can use that change in the frequency and the phase to figure out if the how, uh, basically the wind speed and direction. Now, if that's a little bit over your head and you've never looked at phase diagrams or if this doesn't make sense, just listen to this part. Because we can do this, we can now make a new set of imagery called radar radio velocity imagery, where now we're able to detect the wind speed and direction. And we color code it as such. Check it out. In the bottom, I've got two images. Hurricane Isabel making landfall back in 2003. A massive supercell hitting Atlanta, Georgia in 2008. Both of these images are right now radar reflectivity images. The colors tell you the intensity of the precipitation. So by the way, look, this supercell had a hail core. See the hail in there? What I'm going to do next is I'm going to shift both of these images from radar reflectivity images, which again tell you the intensity of the rain, to radar, uh, radar radial velocity. Here we go. Now, in each image, I have reds or green and blue. Red represents precipitation being blown away from the radar. Green or blue is toward. So where's the radar? Well, the radar in this image is right here where that black dot is located. See the blues on this side and the reds on that side? That's because the hurricane was circulating in a counterclockwise direction. Blue shifted toward the red, uh, radar, red away. Now, do you see how right here in the middle, kind of tracing it, I have this region where I'm getting zero uh, wind speed? That's not because the hurricane stopped blowing. It's still going this way. But you can't detect a Doppler shift when the object's moving perpendicularly to you. It has to be moving away or toward the radar or way or toward you. Now let's go back again. Look over here. On this one, on this image, do you see there's a little hook echo on the back side? Big tornado in 2008 going right toward Atlanta. On radar radio velocity, we have green on this part of the storm and red on this part. So now we're going to use the red green. Now the green on this part, green means precipitation being blown toward the radar antenna. Well, where's the radar? Here red away. That means this part of the storm going away and this part of the storm toward. What that means is this part of the storm must be circulating in a counterclockwise direction. Look at it. Toward the radar, away from the radar. Toward the radar, away from the radar. Toward, away. This is how we detect tornadoes with radar. You just learned how to do and how to find a Doppler indicated tornado. That's how we detect radar with radar tornadoes at night. That's pretty cool. 
All right, let's get some practice. Rate of reflectivity image, Hurricane Maria, double eye wall. This is the image that shows you intensity. So look at the bottom. These colors represent intensity. Higher you go up in the color scale, the more intense the rainfall was. No hail in this hurricane, but some very intense radar, uh, rain, rain bands that we detected with radar. Are you ready? This is a radial velocity image. Now look down at the bottom. Here's a center point. Going this way, these colors represent wind being blown toward the radar. These colors away. So what does this mean? This side of the storm versus this side of the storm toward the radar, away from the radar. Where's the radar? Right here. So one whole half of the storm is green because these storms spin in a counterclockwise direction. So on this side, we can measure the speed toward and on this side away. By the way, the winds are faster on the right-hand side than the left-hand because the hurricane was moving this way. You see this little stripe that I just drew that arrow over where we're not getting any speeds? That's because the flow at that point is perpendicular to the radar beam. And the radar starts here and goes out just like this. And that hole you see there, that's the eye of the hurricane. There's no rain inside there. So there is how you, that's why you see that hole. Now, hopefully that was some pretty good practice. You can watch that again. Just go back and rewind the video and watch it again if you need to see it. But I want to show you this next one. Question for you. Looking here at two different images, on the left, the rate of reflectivity, on the right, the radial velocity. In which general direction is this line of storms traveling? Is it north to south? That would be from the top of the image to the bottom. Is it south to north? That's the bottom of the image to the top. Is it west to east? That's left to right on this image, or is it east to west? Well, what you're looking at here is on the image on the right, this is a massive squall line. So look at this. There's the most intense precipitation right in through there. But the question is, which way is it going? Well, the radar is here. And I see red colors on this side. And then I see the greens and the blues over here. And I see the middle line where there's zero right there. Well, basically, the flow is blue and green to red toward the radar, away from the radar. This squall line was definitely moving toward the southeast, so moving in this direction, okay, from the west to the east. So the correct answer is C. Got it? All right, check this out. Here's the last thing I'm going to teach you. Hurricane Ike, remember talking about Ike when we talked about uh, satellites? Well, Hurricane Ike and the remnants of it, you just watched right there, went all the way to Michigan. Watch it again. Ike makes landfall right here. Goes through Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, parts of Kansas, Missouri, drenches Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. The remnants of this powerful hurricane getting all the way up into Michigan. Now, what's the benefit of this? Well, I can take all of this data and average it over time to give you this map. This is from the Romeoville, Illinois radar. What you're looking at here is radar estimated precipitation, what we call storm total precipitation. Now on this map, you're not looking at a color scale that tells you the intensity. Instead, it's amount. And if you look down here, where we have the uh, scale, it's measuring it in inches of total precipitation. Some parts of Chicago, right in through there, got over six inches of rainfall. Some spots, like right here, here, and here, in the western suburbs and the northern suburbs, got 10 inches of rain. Just so you know, annually Chicago gets about 40 inches of rain. That means in one day, some of the suburbs got a quarter of a year's worth of rainfall. Now, give you another example. Watch the animation in the top. This was on the 5th of, of June 2018. See all the thunderstorms going through there? Going through parts of North and South Dakota, now through Minnesota. Got some storms in Texas as well, down here along the Gulf Coast. Got a bunch of them. We can use the radar reflectivity image to make maps like this. This is a map I made that integrated over time all the uh, radar re reflectivity from these storms and told me how much rain fell out of them. So this is what we can do. It's a powerful tool, radar is, and it's probably a tool that you don't know but it's protected your life and your property more times than you know. And because it can also help us indicate where there's a flooding threat, it's even a better tool because it can estimate total precipitation over time. The invention of satellite and radar has revolutionized weather observation, and it has made us so much more safe with time. And that's why we take these two lectures out to learn about it. So with that, ground-based measurements of precipitation done with radar. Satellite observations, we're looking at clouds. 
two tools that have revolutionized meteorology.